Hello, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Kevin Parikh, who will be introducing our panelists today. With over 25 years of industry experience, Kevin is currently the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Avisance, one of the world's leading business transformation, technology strategy, and sourcing advisory firms. A renowned author and industry leader, Parikh regularly speaks at economic development forums, including the World Bank and United Nations SDG forums. Kevin's Amazon best-selling book, Digital Singularity, A Case for Humanity, lays out opportunities and challenges technology omnipresence poses while providing a framework for approaching innovation and remaining competitive in a digital world. I'll hand the mic over to Kevin. Hello. Kevin? Yes, can you hear me? We can oh, hear you now. Can. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Jessica, very much. I uh, appreciate the kind words. Uh, first of all, on behalf of IAOP, uh, I want to say that uh, we, we all really appreciate these forums. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure uh, to be the chapter chair for the digital chapter. Uh, we are building a very strong agenda uh, for this uh, coming year in 2020. Uh, we're expecting to have some really uh, uh, hallmark speakers as well, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, the topic for today, the future of cloud and, uh, and ERP planning, uh, is really very close to our hearts because as most of our uh, uh, companies and uh, organizations are going through rapid transformation, from a platform standpoint, we have issues of risk and cost, integration of applications, and of course, how this supports the underlying business. We have with us today two um, strong and global leaders uh, representing, uh, I think, uh, uh, two different verticals, but uh, equally uh, 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 sort of engaging speakers, and I'm uh, very pleased to introduce them both. Also, um, again, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that in February we have our uh, IOP summit coming up and uh, I hope all of you are able to make that global summit and I have a chance to meet with you uh, when I'm there. <clears throat> uh, Naresh Lachmandas is uh, our first uh, panelist and um, he is the former CIO at L3 Communications and General Atomics. Uh, he has over 25 years of experience as a CIO. He's also been the CIO of the City of San Diego, both on the government and, and uh, private sector side. He's also worked um, at, uh, as an executive at Sony Corporation and has had uh, you know, years of experience in SAP and platform uh, uh, migrations. Uh, welcome, Naresh. Thank you, Kevin. Also would like yeah. to, I'd also like to introduce Rob Devers, uh, also a uh, former CIO at Verco, uh, he's worked at uh, both Avery Dennison and Dole Foods Company as a uh, VP of Strategy and Architecture. Um, he's got tremendous experience in the retail and manufacturing and supply chain areas. Uh, also uh, brings over 25 years of experience. He's a uh, former uh, Air Force pilot and um, uh, and and a and a, a, a veteran, uh, an honored veteran veteran, and I'm very pleased to have. Uh, Rob join us as well, and um, I think they bring uh, two slightly different perspectives uh, from a commercial supply chain um, er, er, side and also from a uh, government and defense side, and I think it's it's very valuable to hear from them both. Jessica Pfister, I will hand it to you to take over as moderator, and welcome to everyone. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning. One one bit of housekeeping. Uh, I think we need the slides shared right now. Naresh, do you have that going? Um, I will just make sure. Uh, it was being shared. Uh, Looks like there's a share button on the bottom there next to Q&A. Yeah, okay, got it, got it. 
All right. Is is that better? Yeah, there you go. But you. and now put your presentation mode. Got it. All right. Perfect. Okay. All right. Jessica, you want to take it forward from there? Yeah, absolutely. So today, just to kind of go over our agenda, everybody, we're going to give both Naresh and Rob an opportunity to speak, and then we'll go ahead into our panel discussion. It'll be a very open and organic, engaging dialogue, and then we'll go ahead and we'll open the floor up for questions. As Nicole also mentioned, please go ahead if you want to send any questions throughout the duration of the webinar today, we'll be fielding all of your questions and allow you each to be able to ask them. So you'll see here a brief overview. As Kevin you know, explained, we've got two very seasoned CIOs here to have this discussion, and we're really excited to, to get going. So, okay. so um, I, I'll take it over here from Jessica. So, uh, folks, this is Nareesh Shlash from the US. Uh, Real pleasure to be here uh, discussing this subject with you. It's very near and dear to my heart, as Kevin indicated earlier. So basically, I wanted to just, uh, from an agenda standpoint, uh, I'll, I'll start with current state and trends, and then Rob will jump in uh, from that uh, after that, and then we'll have a panel discussion and Q and A. And the intent of the current state and trend is, as as a CIO, we have to make decisions and 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 help the business understand. And part of this process is also knowing what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, what is some of the research behind it? What's the right decision, the right criteria to get there? So, so what I thought we'd start with is, is uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening. So as we talked about the cloud, you know, starting go, going back to 2012, um, it was primarily on trying to cost reductions and efficiencies and uh, but it, over time, this has changed dramatically. The focus now is more on revenue and basically, you know, business outcomes and customer experience. And that's the key component. Uh, and so as, as we go forward, you know, with, with the ERP platforms, which have been traditionally more in, in, your, in your data centers, uh, how is this all going to work as we move forward? So we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later as well. Uh, so what, what, some of the other trends that are out there, um, as you start to look at what's happening, healthcare and manufacturing have been major adopters. And, and uh, on the left side, uh, you'll see in the, in the recent last 12 months, and this is from the research uh, that, you know, that we have in, at Avisant, that's really showing that the government sector is really picking up. But overall, manufacturing, again, is, has been driving this, this change. And this, uh, the, the, the chart on the right is kind of giving you an idea of all the different types of engagements, what's been going on over the years. So at least you have a general idea of what the trends are by industry vertical. Uh, the, this, this slide now goes into a little bit more on, on from, the, from a cost where the, where the spend is occurring. Um, you know, from that standpoint. So you can see, again, healthcare manufacturing is, is really driving that transition to the cloud uh, with and the other ones following up, but a lot of more activity recently on the government sector as well. Now, I just want to also put something out there and, and Rob, I'll let you jump in in a second. So it's not, so when we hear the word cloud, I, I call it, it's cloudy out there. There's lots of different clouds. Uh, and it's not just one, there's a hybrid piece out there. There's a public cloud, there's some dedicated clouds. And this is also showing you where the spend is occurring or the differences in IT spend over, you know, from, 18, from 2018 and projections of 2020. And this is research uh, done by IBM that shows that private cloud, uh, the growth rate is about 15%. The public and dedicated clouds is about 18%, but the internal uh, data center spend is actually dropping 9%. So you can see this definitely a shift. Now there is, of course, uh, some challenges as, as companies go through this equation. You know, some concerns, how am I gonna, how's the data gonna move? What's a connectivity? How do we manage this? And that, those are things that we all need to consider as CIOs, as, as, as industry leaders, how are we gonna facilitate and make sure that this implementation or this transition minimize the impact of the business. So again, just another trend factor to look at. Um, now this is, this is another research that, uh, uh, that kind of gives you an idea uh, 
uh, on the hybrid envi environment and the, pa the pace of adoption, the cloud adoption and the pace. So if you start to look at, um, and is uh, you start to look at enterprise ERPs, it's kind of a cloud adoption is kind of rather than slow side, um, and and some of this has to change and move forward. You know, I I, I kind of uh, ca call it like. Uh, we all struggled with, uh, with uh, you know, going away from Windows 7 and 8 to Office 365. But we're there now. We've accepted this. So similarly, from the ERP standpoint, this is a change that's coming. We all have to deal with it, um, and and it's a transition. Now, how do we help our companies get there uh, so we can move forward and help them really achieve their business outcomes that they're looking for? Uh, this is again giving you a, an idea of the different ecosystems that are out there, and I'm sure uh, you know I might have missed some applications, but generally, uh, in the core is you know your your core ERP systems, SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, Infor. There's a lot more. I just couldn't fit so many icons in there, but the whole point again is that that's your core component. But surrounding it on the peripheral is is supply chain manufacturing, is analytics, and here's all the different uh, providers that work out. Then you have the SaaS platforms, which is you know Salesforce, Ariba, ADP, you know all, all those Workday, etc. And then on the flip side is the cloud service providers, and these are the four big ones. And I'm sure there's a few more that are out there. But the key is we all have to think of this holistically across the board. It's not just it's not just saying, hey, I'm going to move this to cloud. I'm going to save my data in the cloud. This is, you're actually supporting your business in an integrated manner. And how do we make this all work and flow as we move forward? Uh, I threw one last piece in on the AI, uh, you know, robotic process automation, machine learning. Uh, this is the other component that comes into play that helps you know, as we move forward from a business transformation and really helping with the customer component so that's how we pull this together and the cloud platforms are more in you know uh, from an ERP standpoint are better aligned and connected to those capabilities not to say that you can't do the existing platforms but the the APIs etc are, are better better uh, connected there to make that work for you um, some of the challenges uh, that that I see out there, and and I think I'm not I'm sure I'm not the only one. And Rob, you can jump in accordingly. Definitely have to look at from a change management. Um, there's an implication to to your organization, your IT organization, as they are as they're going through this 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 equation. Um, you know, the roles are changing, the needs are changing. Um, from an application integration, um, you know. We have our systems that are, you know, it's not just S, it's just not your ERP platform, it's your peripheral applications. Now, if I'm moving some components to the cloud or all components to the cloud into that hybrid environment, how do we make sure it's all connected and working? So we have to make sure we do our due diligence in that, in that space to, to pull that off. And then we come back from governance and compliance. How do we make sure that transition and, and we have the oversight on that? Uh, because, you know, you now have a cloud, several cloud service providers, you might be also using some SaaS tools uh, to, to support you. And you have to make sure you have the right oversight and compliance from that standpoint to make sure that your business is not negatively impacted. Uh, the, 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 other, the next area is a transition and ongoing support. How do you then transition this process, these applications uh, and all of that uh, and set up the ongoing support model? Um, then as we look at security, uh, it, it, we have to make sure we have those components covered. Now, one of the things that, in fact, I, you know, in the, from a security angle, I was, uh, I get a lot of reports from the FBI, and one of the things we've talked about, the, the shadow IT, IoT devices that are out there, and there's a lot of that happening with the new technologies we have out there, where a lot of people from the business, that, et cetera, that's driving uh, some of the IoT AI type components, we have to make sure that, yes, we want to enable uh, the, the, uh, the transformation that they're driving. We also have to make sure that we're, secure, we're able to secure our content and our data and make it work uh, from that standpoint. So there's, there's, there's components there that we have to account for from security. And the last area that I kind of looked at, call center support. Well, why is that so important? Well, if you think in terms of, I, I now have an organization that was used to 
working with an existing platform that's operational the last X number of years. But now we move into this new hybrid environment with multiple service providers supporting you. If a user has an issue, a security issue, an access issue, et cetera, the call center needs to think of this differently. So this way, it's again, from a business standpoint, the ongoing support as an IT organization, we're enabling and making sure that the continuity is out there. So that's kind of some of the challenges. I'm sure there's a lot more, but I just want to put something out there, uh, just something for us to think about as we move forward. Um, the, the, other, the other part is like any, any project that we go through, and this is some of the benchmarking uh, you know, that uh, we have at Avisan, kind of gives you an idea that you, you start with a certain concept of a business case of, of you know, there's some savings you're looking at, some, you want, at some objectives that you have, but as you start to migrate you know, and transform, there's a lot of value leakage that occurs. Um, and it's really important from the governance and a compliance standpoint that you and your teams uh, are working with and, and providing that oversight to make sure that your, your business and your business outcomes that you're looking for are achieved. So this is a really important component from, you know, whether it's inefficient architecture, support, the legacy integration, all of that comes into play. Some things that you really need to look at as you move forward. Uh, so, um, and uh, that's, that's where I have, Rob, I'd like to turn it over to you now to take it to the next phase. Hey, thanks, Naresh. Um, and uh, once again, hey, everybody, I'm Rob Devers, uh, formerly, um, well, very long titles for both Dole Food Company and Avery Dennison uh, that involves strategy, architecture, large-scale system development, basically CTO. Um, and also a, a former CIO for a furniture company called Burko. Um, so o overall, as I get into this day, we'll, we'll just jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to the first slide here. Naresh? Yeah, yeah, it's not. Thank you. Okay. So big point here. Types of clouds multiple clouds everywhere. I find one of the funniest things I see, and you know, I see tons and tons of articles and things written on this, you know, all the time where people say, are you a hybrid cloud? Are you, are you, are you do you have to look out for being a hybrid cloud? And, and I, I, I almost find it baffling. I mean, I laugh because it would be almost impossible for any organization to not be a hybrid cloud. The definition of hybrid cloud is, do you have two or more Clouds. You know, do you have two softwares as a service? Do you have an uh, on-premise hosted private cloud that's connecting to, you know, infrastructure as a service uh, public cloud? Um, so, I mean, just by virtue of having ADP and Office 365, you're already a multiple cloud environment. So, that is the that this is a foundational thing to think about and look at for the trends going in the future, because a lot of the challenge of the cloud isn't just the one cloud it's the interaction it's the it's the tying it all together of the multiple clouds we're all hybrid cloud okay well what does what does that mean for us you know what does that mean now and what does that mean for trending in the future the role of a of a it leader you know or, or anybody in a, in a business that's dealing with the cloud you know or cio or something like that is back in the day when you were doing digital or technology before it was even digital enablers or things like that folks thought of themselves as builders. You know, I would build some something, you know, like, you know, engineers, I'm building a bridge, and there we go, and I'm gonna build it from the, from the ground up, and there we go, and it's gonna provide an extra value. You know, so I'm going to build a ERP system, a CRM system, something specific. Th that world is gone. There is building, there is specific building, but the role of putting things together to be digitally enabled is that of a broker. It is taking all, I love Naresh's puzzle piece slide. There were puzzle pieces of challenges, but if you actually look at the cloud, it's putting a puzzle pieces all together, all different ways and putting those puzzle pieces together right. Getting one or two good puzzle pieces really doesn't help you unless all the pieces are together right. Uh, you, know, you, know, uh, you, know, con you know, conversely, even if you have some mediocre pieces, but you put them all together very well, you actually could be in good shape. Um, so what are these broker impl implications? You know, let's you know, start you know, looking at that. Well, 
overall, you have to architect holistically. A lot of times, I mean, and to this to this day, I've, I've dealt with some vendor partners. I'm not going to call uh, call them out. I'm not. I'm not. I'm sure specific folks in the organization, but I see them coming in with a point fix. Oh, you want to do you know this in your supply chain? Well, we have this as software as a service in the cloud. Or you are you're having a little bit of pain in one piece of uh, your, uh, your 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 hosting infrastructure? Well, we have this. Some of these point fixes could be good. In matter of fact, back in the day when everybody was putting their toe in the water for cloud, when they were actually just sitting there saying, okay, I, I want to see what this is about first. Sure, looking for your quick hit point fix is a good first stop. Okay, yeah, that's, you know, but once again, to, to get the promise, you have to architect holistically. So, and every time you say architecture, people's eyes often glaze over, but you know, you know, but let's let's even talk about the simplest level, process architecture or capacity or something like that. If you were saying, hey, I want to do something like workflow, you want to make sure something as simple as you don't have two software as a service workflow tools. You don't have, or maybe it would be a platform as a service, but you don't have both SharePoint online and open text doing the same thing. I'm paying double, and I actually have half my organization doing it on one and half doing it on the other, and I have to do extra integration. So you have to architect wholly. Uh, but secondly, now everybody is in the business of vendor management. Instead of just you know, point project by project, you know, say contracting out. Matter of fact, people love integration and having the one throat to choke. You know, it makes it easier. You don't have to have a vendor management organization. That was actually some of the appeal of ERP. And things are not just integrated, but you can go to one guy and say, hey, you know, hey, everybody, you know, here's one piece not working end to end. You figure it out, you know, and I'm only going to negotiate one bill. Uh, well, now, after you put all those different puzzle pieces together, another factor in putting all those puzzle pieces together is okay who has the best vendor management vendor strategy both in functionality and cost that that fits fits my puzzle pieces best as a matter of fact sometimes it might even be let me look at these three vendors they do something different but how do they best connect and then let me negotiate there somebody now has to be at least in charge of some form of cloud vendor management it could be unofficial or something like that but vendor management has to tie all the way all the way up to the, the top. A little bit more data integration, I'm gonna to touch on a little bit more you know, later too. But for you one thing, it, it, a cost in the cloud is how much you know, information is going back and forth and how, and how it actually goes back and forth. Uh, because you have so many puzzle pieces, so many moving parts, how you actually put your data integration together is very, very important. I've had several clients where they, get, they got a little bit of bad news you know, from me where you know, I often say, hey, you're ready to go to the cloud for a certain amount. It is a maturity process, but to reap all the benefits, you have to do cloud prep type of stuff. So, and one of them is data integration. Uh, a few of my clients had this spaghetti of point-to-point -point integration uh, well, not even services, but ways that their that their information was was passing through. Well, they wanted to explode into multiple more points, but you know, by things that actually are now even outside of their uh, their realm. The actual amount of work, the amount of things that they actually have to have to do now to tie things together for data integration, if they did it in a non-scalable way, was not even going to be close to actually well for them reaping benefits. Um, and then and then finally. So, you know, by the way, I'm outlining the challenges. Each one of these challenges, if you approach, you know, holistically, you put all these pieces together, you know, the, the cloud more than justifies it. Um, you know, finally, you know, just, this is a, just a different thing, way of looking at things. Realize, you know, after I set all these challenges, people want to go back, well, can I minimize this? Sure, maybe less providers are better, but you're always going to have a yin and yang push and pull. Let me just give you a ba basic e example. You, you, we love integration. One of the major providers, you know, of course, is Microsoft with Azure. Well, what's the great thing you get there? You are integrated with all your Microsoft tools. Most people here that are listening today have a Microsoft backbone for their actual productivity, their, you know, their presentations, their Word or, or, or whatever. On the other hand, it's proprietary. It, it, and it's very, 
especially even in the platform side of, of Microsoft. So what you gain in integration, you're actually losing in, um, in actual ability to be portable. So at that point, you're going to have to draw a line down, you know, you know, line of sand saying, hey, okay, uh, this, is, this is where the integration starts to drop off in benefits. This is where portability is more important. I need to maybe put that somewhere else in the cloud or still maybe in Microsoft but not in their more propriety type, type of stuff and, uh, and have a multiple cloud. So there's always going to be that push and pull. Okay, uh, next slide, uh, Naresh. Um. There we go. Okay. The types of service, I, you know, I'm calling it a food chain, but it's not like the top always eats the bottom or anything like that. But uh, this is one of the few times, you know, gosh, it's, I'm, I'm becoming that older, that old, it's always that same IT thing, loving, loving the old days. I remember the old days. Oh, so there's already an old days in cloud. I remember the old days in cloud when IS, you know, was IS, PaaS was PaaS and SaaS was SaaS. You know, there's, there's certainly, well, that's three, so that's not binary, but there's certainly, you know, tertiary day where everything fit, fit in the nice buckets. I knew something was, you know, if there was a service, a service uh, we just, it, nothing was done, boom, you, you throw it in there, you know, you just, you just got the, uh, the bare metal bones, whether you knew what they were in, you know, in, in private or if it was you know, ambiguous in public, there you go. I knew what software as a service was. I knew you, know, you have ADP, you had salesforce.com, that's fine. But the biggest thing that's really changed here, back in the day, um, it was, okay, Google Computing Platform, that's platform as a service. Force.com, that's platform as a service. Things that aren't that, you know, that's, just, that's infrastructure as a service. Those days are gone. This tertiary day is, is gone. It's now a full spectrum, you know, especially in matter of fact, it's, everybody's putting in the, in the PaaS area, but it is a full spectrum of different things you can have as a platform. Right here, this is a, was a, you know, a, a sanitized something that I had for you for a different client, but I at least split it up into two of infrastructure platform as a service and application platform as a service. But it doesn't, it doesn't work that way you know, anymore. There's multiple layers. And so this is the, the big trick and the big thing that's going to be the trend going fo forward on and on and on, uh, how you handle this. As a guiding principle, I often write up guiding principles, you know, architectural guiding principles for, for, uh, for my clients. And uh, as a guiding principle, the higher you are on the food chain, the closer you are to a lion, the closer you are to software as a service, or the higher you are on the platform as a service, the better you are. But that's a guiding principle. That's not, you know, a law. I mean, you know, sometimes if you're just in a forest, it'd be better to be a rabbit. You know, a lion might might starve. But you know, say, same thing here. You want to find the appro appropriate touch point or drop off point where you are, and there's there's a lot more. And I want to, and this is especially true when you look. Let's let's look at ERP. Yeah, and, you, and, you say, and first of all, you can look at ERP and say, well, ERP, you go to Workday or something like that, or even certain offerings in, in Oracle or SAP, it's software as a service. But in our old days, we often thought of ERP as a platform. I mean, you go to any Bob, Bob coder with, uh, with SAP, he's coding, a, you know, or she or she or whatever, they're, they're coding, they are coding a platform. Um, and, and usually the general rule is to go up as high that food chain as you can. But let's look at what there is in the food chain. You've got the operating system. You've got the middleware. You've got different levels of the middleware. You have the database. Uh, for um, You often might have an application server level or something like you know, an SAP, like, like basis. So my, my point here is this is something that we will keep looking at. Again, as a matter of fact, anybody who ever comes in and now simplifies Platform as a service is platform as a service, and it's not binary. You know, it, it is not keeping up with actually the technicality that has to go on. What you have to do is now weigh the pros and cons of your own maintenance, uh, all the other costs that go in, the disruption, with how much you can stretch, you know, into into putting something in as much of the platform as possible. And, and remember, all the, the the main major providers now provide each and every one of those different layers. They'll provide operating system layer. They'll provide a some of the middleware layer. They'll provide the database layer. Um, and if you don't know the difference, 
it's it's funny. They, it's, it, as much as they offer it, right now the maturity is not there to really advise you which one to go into. So there it is. And that's, this, tra- this, this trend I think is just going to get more and more complex. I think we're almost going to get to the day where, I mean, we'll still have these categories, but it's just always going to be a, a full, full spectrum. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, Naresh. Okay, biggest thing in making, in making the difference. Oh, oh, right, the cloud. Okay, the cookie jar is here. It's easy to get to. It's, you know, we can spin things up right away. We can do it really, really cheaply. I, I don't have to, you know, if I'm not in IT, I don't have to wait for somebody in IT. I can do my credit card. I can call up Amazon. I can spin up, a, you know, an infrastructure. I can start coding something. I only have to pay for as much as I use. If it doesn't work, I can shut it down. Oh, my, you know, you know the cookie jar is here. Unfortunately, a lot of us are like kids in a cookie jar. Um, matter of fact, a lot of organizations are uh, are like, you know, this is why we have those, uh, you look at these slides here, that, that guy uh, in, in the money vortex. Um, the that, cloud that was, Rob, that was Rob in his younger days. Yes, there we go. <laughs> I don't, you know, my hair is not that dark anymore. No, okay. So, um, so when you look at, if you don't have the discipline that comes with whatever authority or, or power you have, there's a lot, there's a decent amount of trouble. Have you ever heard, um, well, Jessica, do you know, I mean, have you ever heard of the tragedies of what happens to lottery winners? I have, Rob. They, <laughs> they, they say they go bankrupt and broke. <laughs> <Not great. laughs> yeah. Jessica and I were talking about this at the time. We're going to read a couple of them afterwards. They're horrible, horrible, tragic stories. But I think most of you, you know, have heard of these tragic stories. People get, you know, $10 million, and within five years, it's horrible. They're dead or they're broke or because they, they didn't know what to do with it. As a matter of fact, they, they got more than they had, but then they spent more than they had. It's, it, it, you, you almost think it can't be worse. I guess it can't be worse because these people had uh, bare, <laughs> terrible lots in life at the end. But this is what is happening with companies. The whole essence of the cloud is you can pay by the drink. You know, unfortunately, you can drink as much as you want. So what happens is if you're not paying attention to that, you know, we, we used to have because you had to buy something up front. It was a capital expense. It was a big expense up front. All this due diligence happened up front. And then, then other than very mature organizations, people would just go. And they'd go until things start getting slow, and somebody who's running your your knock or you know, your one of your infrastructure guys would start to you know, get tapped on the shoulder, and then they do a resizing. This now it has to be an ongoing process, daily, all the time. If it's done right, yes, there's a lot of savings. There's a lot of things that can go on, and as a matter of fact, there's also a lot of productivity in being able to get what you need going going forward. If it is not done all the time, and I, you know, it's always funny when I'm always saying this. This is just like me, you know, pontificating, eat your vegetables. But you know, I I can't come into places that don't manage place things, and actually, they say, well, I don't want to eat my vegetables. I want to be healthy. No, yeah, this is this is a foundational thing, and it's going to keep getting more and more complex. R- Rob, can I jump in here? I think it. I think absolutely. Uh, I think the key point here is the world as we knew it. It's different. Uh, the, what we what worked in the past, we have to look at things differently. Uh, it's that whole value leakage component that I talked about earlier. Make sure you have the right controls in place. Understand what's behind it. If you're not sure, reach out to some of the experts who can give you some guidance. But it's important that that you understand. It's it's not the same, you know, as I had it before. It's apples to apples. It's actually apples to a grapefruit or something as you go forward. It's it's different, and you just need to make sure you understand what you're dealing with. But what, once you once you have that under control, it, it's a better place. But it and it's where you need to be. It's uh, you you know, you, the world around is changing. Uh, the the businesses around us are transforming, and and if we don't keep up with the changing cultures. You know, uh, you know. I, I use uh, uh, Jim Collins' comment of "You will die if you don't change. You will die." So I think it's important that we we think of it that way and and we build the right controls. And we we're really good at what we did in IT over the years. Now we have to, we have to transform ourselves and look at it differently. So I will turn it back to you. No, that was that was a great follow-on. That was uh, that was all I had for for uh, for this. Let's uh, move it into the the panel. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you, Naresh. Thank you, Rob. Those are both excellent perspectives. So to kick off our discussion, you know, Naresh, you talked about a trends, a lot of trends that we're seeing. I'd love to gather your thoughts. Why do you think the cloud-based ERP has gained so much traction now? So um, it's it's gaining traction. Um, I, I believe for a couple of different reasons. One is, you know, the the business world is changing around us, and and you know we have to drive to continuous improvement and enhance our processes so we can leverage some of the AI, machine learning, etc. Um, but if you look at our, our old school approach to any any ERP platform for those who have implemented ERP systems, you know. We implemented them based on what the business wanted in their old system. So basically, we took the legacy processes, put it into SAP or whatever, in most cases, and, and we're still leveraging those old school processes. They're very inefficient. So if you want to leverage some of the technology, the, the current state technologies as driving the customer experience, you know, it's it's going to be a challenge. Um, the other side is, is uh, as I talked about earlier, the, the, the more current state ERP platforms that are SaaS-based, uh, have better integration from an API standpoint to leverage IOTs, et cetera. And, and the, the other key part uh, to me, I look at this is with all your data on, I call it one hybrid cloud, leveraging Rob's point, because it's it's an integrated platform that sample, it's a single source of truth. It, it helps to drive to real-time analytics, and effective decision-making. When I say effective, it's almost real-time decision-making where you can look at what's going on in the supply chain and, and make an instantaneous decision rather than waiting for a report to come out tomorrow then you can make, then decide how you want to approach it so it's it's a different world so really improve reporting advanced analytics drive to there uh, the other side uh, as i as we talked about is the ability to the agility and the ability to scale rapidly based on demand based on what the business conditions are and that's key uh, again driving to those business outcomes the one area that I think is really something that we all have to look inwardly, um, and it's difficult as a CIO, as somebody who's been running IT organizations, or we've been all part of that, is what is the f core capability of, of that business that you're in? You know, whether it's aerospace and defense, uh, where, you know, whether you're, you're in, the, in the consumer products group, it's not IT. Um, I know that's our jobs, but we have to really think IT is really not a core capability for that business. You know, we need to move away from data centers and custom solutions. Um, and as leaders, we need to provide a strategy that's aligned with corporate objectives to achieve the, 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 and the oversight with the providers. So the idea is we need, to, we need to find a better path forward out of this equation. And that, that's what I think is important. One of the, one of the areas that, uh, you know, when we talk about the cloud transformation, you know, it's a journey, as Rob talked about. It's it's different. We have to think of this differently. Look at it from a different perspective. You know, from and as as many of you folks who've implemented, and I've done several of them ERP implementations. I call it the the legacy solutions, uh, the legacy processes. You know, back then it was painful, the lack of commitment, old school processes, and then for companies to now to go through a whole business transformation. They just don't want to deal with it. It's just painful. You know, it's expensive. It's disruptive. And yes, um, there's a lot of providers out there that are pushing for, you know, greenfield approach. If your company can handle that level of transformation and uh, is embracing it, go for it. I think that's tremendous. However, uh, for the rest of us, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, imagine going to CFO and saying, hey, I want to go to as for HANA, it's going to, you know, the cost for licensing is about the same. I can figure out how to justify my my uh, database, data storage reduction by going to the HANA cloud. However, that transformation piece is going to cost you another, I'm going to say 100 million or whatever the hell the number is, right? And that's, that's, that's a big hurdle that, that we have to cross. So we have, to, we have to, but something needs to be done. You know, status quo is not good, good enough. You know, the technology base is changing across all platforms. And, and, and you know, and we know that SAP has talked about the S4 HANA, uh, you know, 2025. That's when the existing ECC platforms, et cetera, will be out of support. And by the way, we've all known about this for years. It's been, it's been out there in the marketplace since like 2015, 2016 timeframes. You know, I correlate to that Windows 7, Windows 8 thing. You know, we know it's coming. We've kind of just pushed it aside. Uh, but we have to embrace it. We have to do something. So the question is, 
there's there are alternative approaches you know keep it simple i'll, I'll use a 80 20 rule like you know 80 percent brownfield keep it the way it is this way no that part of the business and there's no impact but maybe there's and also there's some transformation like any project that you would do but treat this almost like an enhancement pack upgrade you know it's an it debt issue and just kind of help drive it, put a roadmap together and, and make that happen. So this way, again, it's never easy. I'm not saying it is, it's, but you want to minimize the business impact, minimize the spend, put in the right controls and make it happen. I mean, it, this is, it's a journey uh, and it's not going to be easy. So uh, Jessica, I'm not sure if that helped, but that, those are my thoughts. No, that. that's, that's fantastic. An excellent insight. Thank you, Naresh. So, so Rob, as a follow up, what do you believe is driving this increased traction? Well, the, the, the traction of it together, you know, I, basically I always summarize the, the traction of ERP and cloud together and why we're hitting it at this point right now. First of all, a lot of the other puzzle pieces have, have been taken care of, some pure infrastructure things people have already done. I mean, that's still happening. Uh, then you also have, you know, say, uh, business continuity, disaster recovery. That's already happened. It's gaining momentum. Um, but it's because it's, it's in the adoption phase. But the extra traction that's that's happening in ERP, you know, it, you know, it, it, this reminds me of a of, of a of a good IT joke. It won't sound like an IT joke, but what you and I start, but an IT joke. A, uh, a a pastor and an atheist are arguing in a bar, and they're arguing about the creation of life. And they're and the, and the, the atheist said, "Look, it's 13.8 billion years. We know that, you know." And the and the, uh, and the pastor says, "No, it's six days." And to, to break it up, they have drinks bet on us. They go over to a CIO and they say, hey, so could you even possibly believe that God created the world in six days? And he went, well, you know, absolutely I do, because he didn't have a legacy universe to work with. He got to make it from scratch. He got to make it from Greenfield. That's the whole thing here. Always in our world in IT is connecting with the past. That's the biggest challenge. And actually, we are now butting up against uh, it's it's time to butt up against the past that's been installed in, in, in ERP. You're not going to be able to leapfrog over to the, you know making all this uh, this obsolete. And there is a big promise there. A lot of ERP systems are you know tightly integrated in business processes, all sorts of things. And you want to keep those at least keep you know get more of your investment out for another decade or so. So at that point, yeah, you'll chip away with other cloud things. But actually, you want to bring all your goodness for ERP and get a, milk that a little bit longer in the cloud. And that and you're seeing that's where we're up against right now, and everybody's seeing that uh, that promise. Excellent. Thank you, Rob Naresh. Just want to remind everyone again, we are fielding questions. If you have any questions you want to ask these two gentlemen, please go ahead and use your chat box, and we'll go ahead and make sure that we ask them. Um, yeah. So. Jessica, I just want to right, add right. to, to what to, to that that question that uh, you asked Rob as well. So again, you know, we talked about traditional ERP is highly customized um, and and create creates basically hurdles to leverage existing operations. So we can use IoT devices with existing platforms, but there's definitely hurdles out there. Uh, and by by transitioning to a cloud or SaaS based platform, we have the ability to now effectively use them. And to me, that's that's what's key, and that's probably what's driving some of this change as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And Naresh, on that point, could you kind of elaborate? You talked about you know there's this huge transition, increased traction. What is the sense of urgency for companies to move their ERP platform to the cloud? So uh, definitely, I would say if if somebody is on SAP today, um, it's at 2025. I call it the next gen Y25K. That's my term. Uh, I haven't copyrighted yet, but it, the point being is it's it's like Y2K, but this is a different world. Um, you know, we need to get there. We need to help the companies get there. But on the flip side, um, you know, why do they need to move? Well, if if you're good where you are, the, your your business is not changing. Uh, your your you can stay where you are, but there's, there's going to be a risk that you're going to have to deal with sooner or later with your infrastructure, et cetera, that's going to get outdated. And you have to really decide from an IT debt standpoint, uh, how is the business going to sustain itself and how do you manage that? There was a situation uh, that, I de that I dealt with years ago with, with you know, a finance team was on Oracle 10.7. I'm dating myself here. And they didn't want to apply any patches for years because they didn't want any system downtime. Guess what happened? 
if they had a storage failure, the hardware failed to get new hardware uh, was incompatible with the old operating system that upgrade the operating system incompatible with the version of the Oracle database that was out there. And basically business was at risk. There was significant downtime. You talk about trying to close your books and all that stuff. So again, you, you need to really look at the risk factors, figure out what's, what's out there and make the decision. But on the flip side, you have the SAP piece, I'm sure Oracle, all the other folks have similar ways that they're driving everything to the cloud because they're not going to support the old school systems in moving forward. So you really have to look at it from that perspective. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Naresh, for clarifying that. So a question just came in from an, a participant. With regards to cloud security issues, do you believe that there's less of a security issue today? And that's for Rob. Okay. And yeah, and thanks a lot. Keep those those questions coming in. You know, this is like uh, waiting for the big shoe to drop. I was waiting for the uh, the, the security question. Um, and I, I'm going to do it in, in two parts. I'm going to do it as a as a baseline of you know when I started with the cloud, and then and then how we're progressing and how things are going today. You know, when I first uh, you know at 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 multiple multiple organizations, both well Dole and Avery Dennison, those I would first get the first question was. Is the cloud more or less secure? And uh, and my answer would be as secure, if not more. But you got to change the way you're doing things. Um, you know, I used to like to liken it to a, a bank versus uh, hiding money under your mattress. Um, you know, the bank has a bigger target. You know, most people don't know that there's money. If you hid money under your mattress, you know that it would be there. So you have some advantages. You know, it's hidden away or whatever. But if somebody knew or somebody actually attacked it. You'd, you'd be uh, you'd be in trouble. Conversely, people target banks, but uh, but they have a lot of things in place. They have whole you know security you know guards you know to do things. They have insurance even if something does happen you know you know that can uh, that can stop things. So there's a lot more things that you're at their dis at the disposal. Same thing in the cloud. Um, yeah, whole security organizations that can do a lot more, a lot more things that are, that are at your disposal. But you have to take advantage you know of all these things. Sometimes they come inherently with the providers, and the providers keep folding things in inherently, whether it's Amazon or you know, or Microsoft or whatever. But they're usually actually moving. You know, there's often a, it, there's often a trend, you know, an adoption trend, where a third party actually offers something you know more back to being a broker, and security is part of your brokerage. You need your secure your your CISO now, your chief security officer has to be a broker as well. And has to actually continuously see what is the new offering to uh, to protect things on the cloud. So to answer the question here, is it becoming more more secure? It keeps becoming easier in layering these pieces on um, for security. It also becomes easier that things are are layered, you know, are come come automatically with uh, with vendors. But the problem is, every year the bad guys get better too. So basically, I would say it's 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 keeping up, and it's always going to be a constant, long-term, never-ending marathon where you keep up as a broker, and if you keep up and stay ahead, you can actually make it so there's reasonable risk. Great perspective, Rob. Thank you, Naresh. What are your thoughts? So I've uh, uh, add to adding to what Rob said, I, I look at this from a different point of view. To me, uh, yes, the cloud has, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the Gov Cloud or the secure clouds that can protect your data, you know, with from a compliance standpoint, they have those capabilities, uh, definitely. But think of think of the cloud as an extension of your network at the end of the day. You know, they will protect within the framework that you've signed up for what you what you want them to do, but it's an extension of your network. Now, you still have the vulnerabilities of, you know, I'll call it the, the rob, uh, robs of the world who might use an IoT device or a phone or something or cl click on a phishing thing that's going to expose his identity, et cetera. So those controls still have to come to play. But uh, the other side is, you know, we as I go back to my, my comment made earlier about what's our core capability, the, the, you know, when you look at cloud, uh, you also want to look at a third party a uh, security, uh, you know, firm that can can do the type of due diligence around your environment to protect you rather than trying to, or the services rather than doing it internally because you can never do it as well as those guys do. From a data center standpoint, those guys got it covered. But it's it's your ID, your access, your perimeter 
that that you also have to make sure you control. So this, uh, to Rob's point, this the CISO, the controls, the the communication, the training of the people around it, um, and, and the vulnerabilities are there from your network. It's a question is how do you how do you better control that piece? But the data side, they have it covered. It's just now the access that that's enabled uh, from that standpoint. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Naresh. So I think it's a great segue. Um, so, so Rob, how do you think, that, how does the transition to the cloud impact the IT organization, people training? You spoke a lot about you know, cloud prep. What does this look like? Well, it, there, there's a few things here. I, for my theme, I'm going to sound like you know a broken record. You could have a lot of uh, you know, a lot of things are going to be better, but you're going to have to go about it you know a, a different way. And you're going to have to be, people are going to have to be better at putting puzzle pieces together and brokering them. Now, if we first look at just the plain competency level, um, you, you've got, you, you know, you've got to trade, you can retool people, especially like in infrastructure as a service, um, in, in how to actually manage infrastructure, you know, as a service as opposed to on ho you know, hosted, um, fairly read readily. I mean, but it is different. You know, and once again, it, it is different in terms of the focus. You know, as I mentioned before, the demand management is uh, is very, very you know important. Somebody who actually would just check this, you know, occasionally now actually has to let, you know be looking at this and actually have a dashboard and metrics and be looking at that you know a lot more. Uh, secondly, we already touched on with security. Security now, you know, is uh, you're going to have to be have a lot of different you know things. We talk about some of the basic things. You know, but, you know, back in the day, we had multi-factor authentication. We didn't just didn't know it when you're in an organization because, uh, you know, along with what you, you know, what you know, say a password, you knew something of what you were because you 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 were able to get in the building. You know, so that actually was a badge or that was a second factor. Now, you know, th that second factor is gone, and you have to have some other things, you know, go, you know going on. So you'll have to have some other piece. You know, once again, your the security person will actually have to be a broker that's actually layering these other pieces on. And then, you know, finally, any piece of both your architecture, your your uh, your PMO, your project management, and then finally your procurement have to have a cloud you know, a, a extension. And actually, just let's look at the you know, what, these pieces. You know, once again, in um, <clears throat> in uh, your procurement organization. You do now have to get get up the maturity ladder to actually have vendor management to know your different cloud providers and how they work together and what their long term strategy is. Uh, for for architecture, uh, you actually do need to actually somehow at least at a high level know your different processes and how they map into the cloud. You know, and then finally, uh, finally this is. Uh, We've broken into into this. You know, I, th I think we might even talk about it later. But finally, because the cloud enables, you know, it, you know, in regular development, agile delivery, DevOps delivery, you know, a, a decent amount. Um, you now actually have to be more mature and careful of what you're doing in your PMO organization. Uh, very, very simply, I've seen a lot of folks think, well. You know, I have my panacea. I have my technology solution. Um, uh, I, in terms of now, I can just be agile. I can just, or you just do DevOps. I can multiply, you iteratively throw things out. I don't have to have a work plan. I don't have to have a budget. I don't have to have things. Well, that goes as, as well as as uh, I would think most of you would think it would go. It's it's a, a complete and total disaster. Um, the iterative development you know, uh, uh, methodology in agile. And done with DevOps, um, still require a lot of discipline, a lot of work, and they actually still have to be segmented out of when you will do those and when you will actually do uh, overall waterfall. This has to be in a whole big, big, big structure. It can't be you know, seat of the pants. So that final maturity also has to be there in PMO. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I know we have a couple minutes left, but Naresh, from your vantage point, what do you believe uh, the impact is of this transition? So a couple of things. So I'll I'll add to what Rob said. From an I'm going to be real quick on the agile piece on on uh, from a ERP solutioning standpoint. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I heard about that, I, I was like skeptical. But I hired uh, a gentleman by the name of Joe Mazinski when I was at L3 Comsystem West, and 
he came from the army and he was phenomenal at driving that whole piece that and really showed me how we can leverage agile delivery within ERP platforms and uh, really de- pull that off. And, you know, we can have sidebar discussions later about that. So I want to put that out there. So it is, you can do it. It's, it's doable and for large projects as well. Uh, coming back to the, the, the other side, uh, you know, as Rob was talking about, the value leakage is really key. Uh, and if we, we have to train the folks to think differently, think about how you want to approach uh, uh, this whole piece because y- you people are going to want to have test systems, platforms, et cetera. Uh, we have to make sure we train them. We, we have the controls in place. So the spend is not getting wild and, and out of control. And that's really key. So to me, it's, a, it's training. Yes, you still need leadership. You need the governance. You need the oversight. But these controls, again, going back to the early discussion, is different from what we've done before traditionally in IT. And we have to look at this differently. It's a journey, but you need to start somewhere. And, and if, you know, if you need some help, some guidance, you know, reach out to some of the people who've done this or some specialists so you can put those controls in place. I think that's key moving forward. Yeah, and I did, that's what I tack back on to make sure that I'm, I'm clear with you too. I mean, you know, it's hitting those different, you know, areas, you know, change and hit on the PMO area. Um, the, yeah, the promise of Agile and DevOps is, is huge. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very important. You found somebody who could do it right. And it yeah. is very, it's, it's not simple. It's just as hard as the old traditional way. Uh, but the, uh, and if it's done right in, you know, in, in a good way, it can it have a lot of promise, but not done that way. It can be a big, you know, absolutely big problem. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Folks, we are nearly out of time. I just want to thank our guests for sharing their perspective with us today. We'd also like to thank our listeners for your attention, your engagement. If you want to learn more about the IAOP digital chapter, you can go to the IAOP website. That's www.iaop.org. We hope that you'll respond to the invitation you'll receive to provide us with feedback on this program. We really appreciate it. Those responses are very helpful to us. Thanks so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day.